first Richard Dole seminar of the term. And I'm very pleased that uh, our own uh, David uh, Hunter has agreed uh, to speak today. Um, I just wanted to start by introducing myself. My name is Joris Hemmler, and I'm organizing the seminars together with Leon Peter. So if you have any um, guests or visitors or anyone else you think who might be able to give an interesting talk, please contact us because we do, um, well, we are looking for speakers uh, for the next term and the terms after. So, um, without further ado, am I doing something wrong already? Thank you. Right. And just the last thing to say for people at home, uh, please put your questions in the chat and then we'll get to that uh, at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to, uh, as the Richard Dole Professor, kick off the new season of Richard Dole Seminars. Um, I was sort of wondering, actually, looking at the picture, what Richard Dole would have made of polygenic risk scores. Uh, on the one hand, he might have thought, well, this is big epidemiology, because essentially polygenic risk scores uh, really can be calculated for pretty much any disease or phenotype where you've got enough numbers. Uh, so it's big in terms of cross-cutting lots of different uh, disease endpoints. Uh, on the other hand, it can be quite small when you start to put polygenic risk scores in the context of other big risk factors such as smoking and overweight. So that's my talk. We're done. <laughs> um, so I'd like to just quickly review the science behind polygenic risk, how we develop polygenic risk scores, uh, look at a few examples of PRS and disease, consider the potential for clinical application, and end with uh, some very, very preliminary information about a new major cohort um, that we're running in the United Kingdom. So this is the way that we did genetic epidemiology in the 20th century. Uh, there must be a broken gene that we could find. Uh, we could often see that Unfortunate families had a very high burden of a particular disease or condition. So let's get uh, DNAs on lots of members of the families, trawl through the DNA and see if we can find the gene and the piece of the gene uh, where there's a mutation that's being inherited and is segregating with the disease condition. And out of that came things like BRCA1, BRCA2, et cetera, et cetera. There's about, uh, I believe, four or 5,000 of these now um, but the common characteristic is that these tend to be pretty rare families, uh, pretty rare mutations, usually much less than 1% in any population. So um, starting in this century, we began to appreciate that uh, if you looked at polygenic risk, so you found gene variants that often conveyed a very, very low relative risk. But if you could put them together, uh, some people would have inherited a larger handful of variants that uh, were associated with disease. Some people would have inherited a smaller handful, and you could put this on a, essentially a normal distribution of risk, and that's polygenic <laughs> risk. And all of this only became possible when the gene chip technology came along and we could go from looking one gene at a time to looking across the entire genome. Uh, genetic epidemiology, they don't like people saying it, but they essentially converted from the study of families to conventional case control epidemiology, if you're lucky, nested case control in a cohort. So let's run the gene chip technology in as many cases as we can find, often scouring the world for samples in big consortia. Let's run them against controls. Um, controls are often not what we would consider as controls. Often they're not matched. Sometimes they come straight out of some in silico database, often uh, genotyped in a different part of the world. But as long as at least their ethnicity matched, race ethnicity matched, you can often get away with that sort of epidemiology, which you would never get away with in conventional risk factor epidemiology. And so out of this, comes a, an enormous amount of individual chi-squares, uh, started off 
with the gene chip technology, uh, about 100,000 different gene variants across the genome. Then it went to 500,000. Now it usually runs about a million. Uh, then Goncalo Abacasis and others discovered that you could actually impute from the information you had into large databases. And so you could literally calculate for any individual <laughs> at each of, in, of each individual gene variant site uh, for up to 10 or 20 million variants across the genome. Um, so this is the typical display, a so-called Manhattan plot. Uh, the colors are the different chromosomes. The height is the inverse of the p-value because we're uh, doing so much multiplicity, we're testing uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of chi-squares, you need to insist on a very, very low p-value. And so the very top of the uh, p-value, inverse of the p-value distribution is where we're looking. And here was the first, uh, one of the first scans for breast cancer and uh, variants in a gene called FGFR2 popped up. Now, this is not bracket one, bracket two. Uh, the relative risk for carrying a single copy of the uh, FGFR2 risk variant was about 1.3, 1.6 for carrying two copies. That compares with a relative risk of about 20 at young age for something like BRCA2. But the difference is uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, in most populations, substantially less than 1% of the population, whereas for FGFR2, about 60% of men and women carry at least one of these variants that have a lower risk. So um, expand the sample size, expand the sample size, get more and more of these, and you can put them together into a polygenic risk score. Um, just a simple calculation, looking at the individual, individual betas, adding them up, everything is log additive. And just with the first 10 variants that were discovered for breast cancer, we could already outperform the classical breast cancer risk prediction based on age, family history, uh, age at first birth, parity, et cetera. Uh, so these AUCs are pretty unimpressive. We weren't doing a very good job with the clinical prediction algorithm in the first place. But um, here, this is the AUC in uh, blue for the genetic model, just taking the first 10 gene variants the previous best non-genetic model didn't do quite so well. Of course, if you put them together, um, they do better because they're pretty much completely uncorrelated. Even a polygenic risk score has a very, very low correlation with family history for almost all diseases. And then if, you, if you're thinking of relative risks, uh, <coughs> 10 variants, so the minimal number to inherit is zero. The maximum number is 20. Almost nobody carries uh, zero or 20 because uh, these are all independently inherited. Um, but if you carry a low number of adverse alleles, then uh, there's a stepwise increase as you carry more and more uh, adverse alleles with tight compensables. So that was just the first 10. That was 19, sorry, 2010. So that was basically the first essentially two years of polygenic risk score development. The field exploded. Um, these are data you can get from EMBL and uh, across more than uh, uh, 200 conditions and phenotypes, almost 6,000 publications, uh, over 400,000 individual associations in those publications. Um, there's almost no part of the genome that's untouched that doesn't have some relationship, again, with very, very low relative risks with uh, one of these many, many, many diseases or phenotypes. And for breast cancer, based on about 110,000 cases pooled in the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, uh, there's about 180 variants that meet the criteria of genome-wide significance. That means that the p-value for that individual chi-square for that one of those 180 variants, that p-value is less than five times 10 to the minus eight. So Breast Cancer Association Consortium, um, working across, in this case, 95,000 cases pulled from 69,000 case control studies, um, sneaking a little bit into the territory of p-values that don't quite meet genome-wide significance, so 313 single nucleotide polymorphisms in the PRS. Um, you can 
develop a nomogram. So if uh, a woman is in the top 1% of calculated risk of the normal distribution, uh, lifetime risk is calculated at a little over 30%. That does start to shade into the lower end of the estimated lifetime risk associated with carrying a BRCA1, BRCA2 variant. But again, it's just the top 1%. Um, if you look at the top 5% versus the median, that's about a threefold. Uh, if you cheat and you look at the top 5% versus the bottom 5%, that's about a sixfold. Sounds a little more impressive. And um, the next slide is, I think, the one that I still get a little bit of chills about. So in the Breast Cancer Association Consortium, segregating out the much smaller number of nested case control studies, um, BCAC looked at the uh, relative risks per standard deviation of the polygenic risk score across the 10 uh, prospective studies. This is health study and this is health study two, the studies I used to work on before I came here. And uh, the results are actually bomb-proof. I mean, they almost completely line up. And the meta-analysis gives you a relative risk of 1.6 <coughs> per standard deviation. And lo and behold, then UK Biobank comes along. Uh, again, if you look in the prospective component, uh, almost exactly the same relative risk. So unlike most of our environmental and lifestyle risk factors, where uh, due to the play of chance, but also due to the prevalence of the factor and our sample sizes, we often see quite a bit of heterogeneity. Um, this is actually bomb proof across all of these studies, asterisk, mainly uh, in this case of women of European ancestry. Um, just again to note that as soon as you feel like you're successful for any particular phenotypal condition, we can start to look at subgroups. And so uh, on the left, this is breast cancer calculated uh, or the risks calculated for ER positive disease, which is most of breast cancer in these studies. Um, but we don't have such a good predictor if you're interested in ER negative disease, um, partly because the cumulative incidence of ER negative disease is a lot lower. It's less common than ER positive. Um, but also because we've essentially trained our model on studies that have uh, mostly ER positive cases. So the top to bottom risk is a little bit less than it is for ER positive. So um, we will never end doing research on polygenic risk scores because basically the moment you get enough to look at uh, a disease overall, then you have to start to look at the different subtypes of disease and you might get <laughs> slightly different answers. So how many SNPs in a PRS? So basically the uh, instinct in the, in the first cut is, well, let's just use genome-wide significant SNPs. And even for the common uh, conditions where you've got a lot of data, even for things like blood pressure, quantitative traits, height, where you can measure this across a million people now, you still tend to wind up with uh, several hundreds of genome-wide significant SNPs. For rare diseases that occur uh, just in maybe, you know, a few hundred people in the world per year, we may never have enough sample size to be able to uh, calculate a robust polygenic risk score. But you can relax the significance, um, go to many hundreds, a few thousands, or you can actually put all of the data in the model and calculate across the entire distribution and start to use millions of gene <coughs> variants. So um, I'll show a little data, but the quick answer is that if you just go genome-wide significant, um, you get most of the information. If you start to relax, uh, you get a little more information. If you go to millions, for some phenotypes, you get a little more information again, but most of the gold is in the first set of nuggets that you uh, uh, are able to sort of mine out of the ore. Um, I'm not gonna talk about this subject for another day perhaps. But uh, you know, in the 90s, 80s and 1990s, I spent most of my time writing grants saying, we're gonna discover these things called gene environment interactions. And what we meant was that there would be uh, supra-multiplicative associations or maybe infra-multiplicative associations 
between some maybe dichotomous environmental or lifestyle factor and some summary of the genetic data, gene-specific or we weren't thinking polygenic risk of any. So candidate gene. And uh, by and large, we haven't found any of these. By and large, the risks just multiply. If you take your genetic risk and you take your environmental and lifestyle risk, if you just make it easy and you dichotomize the genetic high-low, you dichotomize the environmental high-low, you just multiply the relative risks and you will get the fitted answer. So in other words, if you put in a simple multiplicative interaction term in the model, um, the p-value for that multiplicative interaction term would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.0. Um, so a lot of people were kind of really bummed about this because we'd sort of promised the funding agencies that we'd find a lot of people who were sort of more susceptible to the lifestyle or environmental factors. And we might find some people who are actually quite resistant. And uh, that's not what we found at all. We just found that they're sort of log additive or multiplicative. Um, the fact is that makes it a lot easier to do a risk prediction. If we had to account for these sort of jackpots all over the place of this gene and that uh, environmental factor, we'd have a much harder time coming up with individual risk and telling people about individual risk. So in fact, it's kind of a blessing in some disguise. The, the exception is pharmacogenetics. And the reason that's an exception is that uh, if I take a drug, there'll be, you know, at most probably a few dozen gene products that metabolize that drug to the active form or detoxify that drug and help me excrete it. And so if uh, there's a normal distribution of the ability to detoxify or metabolize, if there's a few percent of people who are like really bad at metabolizing, then that drug won't work so well. Uh, often, if they're really bad at metabolizing, they'll build up a high blood level and they'll experience the toxicity of the drug. So in pharmacogenetics, uh, it's different because we're not dealing with the whole genome. We're just dealing with a small handful of genes that are sitting right on a known biochemical pathway where if there are substantial between person variation in the ability to uh, metabolize that drug, that will convert into substantial kind of jackpot risk of uh, side effects by building up high blood levels, or if someone's a super good at excreting the drug, then the drug won't have its desired for efficacy. So that's gene environment interaction in a slide. Um, it, one of the things that is just abundantly obvious is that because of you know who was in epidemiologic sample sets when this technology came along, mainly in uh, North America, US, Canada, UK, Europe, Australia, bit of New Zealand. Uh, most of this information has been derived from people of European ancestry. So that's the curve on the left there. And on the right, you can see that people of European ancestry are in a distinct minority for the global population. Um, we do a little bit better for the blue there, East Asian, because China and Singapore have come to the party with substantial epidemiologic data sets. Um, but we do distinctly poorly for African ancestry, that's the purple. And so there's a long way to go before we have uh, continental ancestry specific information. So a lot of people conclude then that, well, this may be something that could be used among people of European ancestry, but we need to forget about it for non-European ancestry. And the answer is you just have to look at the data you have, uh, disease by disease. And for some diseases, you don't do too badly for non-Europeans. So these are data from Peter Donnelly. Uh, on the left, the breast cancer nomograms for women of European descent. On the right, in UK Biobank, the uh, non-European as a group. And uh, you get less top to bottom relative risk, but you still get something that is non-trivial in terms of top to bottom. Uh, now, the secret here is they've lumped non-European, so that effectively is South Asian and African ancestry, and uh, these do, for breast cancer, do better for South Asian than African ancestry. So we still need to 
build up the databases for particularly uh, continental African ancestry. In some cases, the models sort of surprisingly outperform. So this is again, this is a recent uh, MedArchive publication from uh, Genomics PLC. And uh, on the left, this is the model for type two diabetes, top to bottom relative risk. Uh, on the right, uh, this is again, UK Biobank. So this is looking at diabetes in the South Asian participants in UK Biobank. And um, the prediction of high risk, which again is substantially derived from European ancestry data, you predict a higher lifetime risk uh, in South Asian people if you are in the top 3% of the polygenic risk distribution. And if you're in the median, um, that's about a doubling of risk in the South Asian population. So even although the model's been developed on European ancestry, um, it predicts higher risks in South Asian ancestry. And this is not because uh, there's some trick in the polygenic risk score, it's just because the prevalence of diabetes is much, much higher in South Asian uh, participants in UK Biobank and uh, the rest of the UK and much of the rest of the world than it is in European ancestry. So um, you could look at that and say, well, actually, this is pretty predictive for South Asian ancestry. We shouldn't use the fact that we didn't derive the model in South Asian ancestry people to say that this would have no clinical utility. So to summarize that, um, Polygenic risk scores are risk factors. They provide new information about disease risk that we didn't have 10, 12 years ago. Um, they often outperform the prior environmental or lifestyle risk score. Um, I chopped out the slide about coronary artery disease, um, but uh, Peter Donnelly and others have shown that if you add the PRS to the conventional American Heart Association or QRISC-3 predictors, you move a substantial number of people above the uh, arbitrary dichotomous threshold for having the conversation about statins, and you move a few people underneath it. So it has a sort of clinical, uh, potential clinical implication. Um, we've got really substantial validity at this point for common, but certainly not uncommon diseases. We just don't, don't have enough. And, you know, I think the utility is very much based on absolute risk. So for common things, the common cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, maybe it will be worth me knowing my polygenic risk score for those. For the super, super rare stuff, there's probably not much point in telling me that I'm at threefold risk of soft tissue sarcoma, when fortunately soft tissue sarcoma, I have a probability of less than one in a thousand in my entire life ever being diagnosed with. So it's probably always gonna be mo most relevant to the common conditions. Um, you only need to do this once in your life and including computational power, at least in big studies like UK Biobank, um, you can get this across all of the available PRS for about 15 to 20 quid uh, at this point. Uh, obviously the commercial providers charge you more because they don't have the economies of scale, plus they're trying to make a profit. Um, but even 23andMe will now sell you this for about $99. Um, validation beyond European ancestry is still a work in progress. And, um, you know, just so interesting to note that these results have only been available because of just an unprecedented level of data sharing that uh, has really, I think, transformed at least this branch of epidemiology in the last 15 years. Um, let me show you some results from uh, the guys in the Translational Epidemiology Unit that sort of bear on this. So back to breast cancer, uh, let's look at quintiles of polygenic risk. Um, I showed a version of this before. This is quintiles, so that top line is just the top 20%. We're not talking about the top 10, 5, or 1%. Um, we're still getting up to about 15% um, lifetime risk and uh, much, much lower risks if you're in the bottom 20%. And if you do the calculation, uh, now we've split it into top 1% in red, uh, then the five, sorry, the second to fifth percentile, and then the uh, fifth to 10th percentile. So essentially above here is essentially the top 10% of risk. If you look at the NICE guidelines, 
This would qualify you to be moderate risk for breast cancer, um, which would, in theory, qualify you for uh, earlier onset. So the standard onset is age 50, but according to the NICE guidelines, if you're in this top 10%, it's actually about top 12, 13%, um, you'd qualify for annual mammography starting at age 40, and then optional annual from then on. Um, the problem is you can't take your polygenic risk score uh, if a, some research study has given it to you or you've gone and got it through some commercial advisor and show up at the mammography van and say, here's my polygenic risk, I'm 40, please start screening me every year because that conversation hasn't been uh, completed with the screening services. So, um, you know, this is the biggest single issue with polygenic risk score. How do we integrate this? with preventive and clinical services. So here are the data for coronary heart disease. I got the slides out of order, I apologize. So basically, uh, if you take um, younger people, uh, age 40 to 54 in UK Biobank, and you draw the red line at the American Heart Association risk of 7.5% risk over the 10 next year, next 10 years of having a uh, coronary heart disease event. Um, and that qualifies you for statins, according to the American Heart Association. If you just ran the AHA model, um, you get these distributions. 7.7% uh, of people uh, qualify for statins at this younger age. Um, if you add the PRS, then some of these people go below the bar. Um, but quite a lot of these people go above the bar. So you go from 7.8% statins to more like 12% eligible. We could have a discussion about the medicalization of risk. Um, and then what do you do about these people? So basically, on Monday, I ran your American Heart Association risk, and I said, you know, you're just underneath the threshold. You don't need statins. And on Friday, I add your PRS um, Sorry, I, on Monday I said, you do need statins, and on Friday I had the PRS, and now you're just under the risk. Well, maybe I'll stop the statins. So uh, again, integrating this into clinical practice is gonna be the issue, um, but it is quite reproducible. These are the actual risks um, for, in red here, these are people who were high risk before and after we added the PRS, and in purple, uh, these are the people who were not high risk, but we added the PRS, they became high risk these are the people who were at high risk, but uh, then became uh, low risk on, on the dichotomy. Um, so uh, again, pretty robust separation when we add this new component of risk. Looking at diabetes, um, here's quintiles of risk of diabetes. The one thing we know about diabetes is in addition to age, it's all about body mass index. Um, big relative risks for being overweight versus normal, big relative risks for being obese versus overweight. Um, but in each category of normal, overweight, and obese, there's a robust separation of being in the highest quintile versus the lowest quintile of polygenic risk. A little <coughs> bit attenuated if you're uh, obese, but still um, a relative risk of more than three. And this is quintiles. We're not going to like the extremes here. Model them both together. Uh, so if I'm high PRS and obese, um, that's a relative risk of about 25 compared with a reference category, normal weight and low polygenic risk. Um, but the big question is, again, how would this change our recommendations? <laughs> So right now I go to the clinic, they measure my body mass index and uh, give me advice, decide whether to do a hemoglobin A1C, bit of an expensive test, don't want to do it in everybody every five years, so we're using essentially family history of diabetes and body mass index to decide who qualifies. Um, so if I'm normal weight though, but I'm in the highest category of PRS, um, I'm now approaching the median risk of someone who's overweight. Um, 
and certainly above the risk of somebody who is uh, in the lowest category, who is overweight, but is in the lowest category, lowest decile of PRS. Um, similarly, if I'm overweight uh, and I'm in the highest category of risk, I'm in about the lowest quintile of people who are obese. So uh, you can imagine that this could add substantially to the triage, essentially, of who should be worked up for diabetes, if and only if you have the polygenic risk score information. And of course, uh, there are very few people around here walking around with their polygenic risk score for diabetes on a uh, in, a, in a way that it can actually even be integrated with the electronic medical records. So this is the challenge for the future. Um, so for breast cancer, if and only if you knew your PRS, you could imagine that could alter the age of screening mammography or the frequency of mammography. Diabetes, uh, if and only if you knew, knew the PRS, you could imagine that this could alter the clinical um, offering of workup for diabetes uh, down the road. Now, all of this got a particular shot in the arm when uh, a group at the Broad Institute took the UKB data, calculated these uh, polygenic risk scores for five conditions, and said, wow, um, if you're in the top 1% of risk, you have the risk of someone who we currently, if they have a single gene mutation, treat differently from everybody else. We screen them more often, we put them into preventive programs, etc. cetera. Um, the genomics PLC people have just done this again in a little more detail with a little more rigor, and they essentially come up with the same answer. So um, in blue here, uh, these are people in the highest 19% of polygenic risk score for coronary artery disease. In the red, these are people with a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, where you've got single gene mutations in one of uh, six genes that determine or play a role in determining what your LDL cholesterol is. And uh, so currently, uh, the NICE guidelines say we should be out looking for people with familial hypercholesterolemia because we can put them on a statin, we can drop their cholesterol, we can... Uh, substantially lower their risk of heart attack. That's about, I think, 4.2% of the UK B population. Um, now we're saying, well, we can do a polygenic risk score and we've got 90% of people who are about the same risk. So what about them? Uh, should you ignore them? Well, again, uh, you probably wouldn't ignore them if you had the information, but we're not doing gene ship analysis on everybody. The question is, should we? And these graphs to show basically the relative risks, but the substantial number of people that the clinics would have to deal with, that currently we go to a high risk clinic. Uh, some of you are in the high risk uh, cholesterol business. Um, so we could give you a young age, 18 fold more people to see, at higher age, 30 fold more people to see. Um, we'd have to do this in primary care, obviously. And uh, uh, that's where basically all the action is. Primary care is already flooded. So, you know, how are we going to integrate with the NHS? So um, that is all some version of reality if that top 1% is really robust. Um, so Pete Kraft and I just did a back of the envelope calculation back in 2009 where we said, well, okay, we've got these polygenic risk scores. We think we're doing pretty well. We're outperforming the, the clinical risk prediction. But we know there's many, many undiscovered alleles uh, that will come as we increase the size of the case series in the consortium. So um, just assuming that these are randomly segregated and making some plausible assumptions about the number of alleles and the relative risk per allele, how would the risk look if you added uh, 200 more of these and 400 more of these. And um, we discovered, modeled, um, that there'd be quite a lot of people here uh, who were told that they had triple the median risk, who when you added the new information would actually be below the population average. And in blue here, vice versa, people who were told that they were below 
the median risk. But when we added the information, they'd be above the risk. So in those days, it was pretty clear that this was premature and we had to add a lot of variants. But what sort of happened was we kept on discovering these variants. Now we're in the hundreds. The relative risk for each additional variant is tiny, literally like 1.02 for carrying one copy, 1.04. We've got that sort of resolution uh, and these reproduce with the massive sample sizes of 100,000 cases. And um, study after study showed that when I do another turn of the wheel, I add another 30 or 50 of these. The area under the curve that I get for the receiver operated curve kind of but doesn't budge. So we thought, well, uh, diminishing returns have set in. We're not going to get much better at this for the common conditions. Um, so the guys in the transition, translational epidemiology unit uh, wanted to ask a question. Well, if we go to the literature and we uh, take out a polygenic risk score, in this case, polygenic risk score A, published by a reputable group, usually from the worldwide data, um, and then we find another one, polygenic risk score B, often starting with exactly the same data, but using different statistical techniques to prune the data and calculate the polygenic risk score. Um, would we reach different predictions for individuals? And uh, we did this for three diseases, breast cancer, hypertension, and dementia. And as you can see, the errors, errors under the curve um, you know, fractionally higher in each case for the more recent PRS, but, you know, essentially the same. And so all of this seems very compatible with we're adding minimal information with the diminishing returns have set in. These things are pretty stable. The problem is when you actually go to the individual correlation of these polygenic risk scores, uh, the situation changes a bit. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're dealing with a small number of SNPs or a large number of SNPs um, or sort of equivalent numbers. If you, uh, these are the odds ratios for the high versus low comparison. You know, they're all a little higher for the second PRS than the first PRS, but they're sort of in the same ballpark. The AUCs are all essentially exactly the same. But if you just but on the correlation, they only correlate at 0.6 to 0.7, which the moment you know that, it virtually guarantees that when you do the cross classification of risk distribution for PRS A versus risk distribution for PRS B for the same <laughs> disease, you're going to get a lot of discordance. So uh, you tell me I'm the top 1% for PRS A, for uh, not in my case breast cancer, but hypertension, um, then you run PRS B. And now there's only a 23% probability that I'm still in that top 1%. For the top 5%, it's a 36% probability. So it turns out that differences in which SNPs you choose and how you weight them in the PRS make a big difference to the individual risk prediction. And I think this is an issue that the field hasn't really faced. Um, so again, I come in on Monday, you run PRS A, you tell me I'm at the same risk as someone who has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. Um, on Friday, you run PRSB, and I drop out of that 1%. Not far. Maybe I drop to the 97th percentile. Um, but now I no longer qualify according to your guidelines for the workup. Um, so uh, you have to, I think, be a little bit careful about rushing this into the clinic until we work out what the best practices are in deriving these PRS. So in summary, in terms of clinical application, um, one of the cheapest tests we can do, they're not diagnostic, just risk factors. Um, you know, those correlations of 0.65 between PRS, PRS A and B, that's what we get for biomarkers like cholesterol or blood pressure over five years. So we're really, you know, in more of a biomarker territory cur currently you know, the, the thinking obviously is it's genetic, it's fixed at birth, it doesn't change. Um, but the way you actually measure it and determine it is what's changing. And it gives you quite a uh, different look at the predictive value. Um, of course, we need to incorporate these into current clinical risk scores. 
you know, my PRS if I'm a smoker for lung cancer is kind of irrelevant. Um, how will people at high risk react? Will people at low risk assume that they don't have to follow our current lifestyle guidelines? How are we going to convey dozens of these? Um, lots of information. You know, we do this for biochemical testing. We routinely measure dozens of things and we just asterisk a few things for the uh, patient or clinician to pay attention to. Um, we have to really rigorously look phenotype by phenotype about what happens with non-European ancestry. Um, MHRA still hasn't told us who's going to regulate these things. They're, they're in the process of trying to do that. And, and our clinical systems are nowhere near ready for this level of information. For those of you who um, want to do this for yourselves, then um, here's a paper that uh, Jennifer Colster and Jean Anne Liu and Leigh Clifton um, wrote. Uh, it's essentially the recipe for taking uh, the UKB or any other large scale data and taking uh, the, the uh, information you can get from the large consortia and calculating in a data set. And the data is freely available um, in the GitHub, the programs. And then if you don't want to do that, then uh, Genomics PLC is just put into the literature, sorry, put into the database UKB, all of their polygenic risk scores for a large number of UKB phenotypes. And in the black box, um, these are relative risks per standard deviation. Um, sorry, the black dots, they claim to outperform for each phenotype the previously published academic publication. Um, the only slight problem is that their approach is rather black box. And so nobody really knows how they've achieved that slightly higher performance, but it's all there uh, to be looked up and put in your basket from UKB. Um, just thanks to all of the uh, many, many people in the consortia that derived a lot of the data and the people in the TEU um, notably Lake Clifton, Jennifer Colster, Jean and Lou, and more recently Tom Littlejohns, who've been working on a lot of the unpublished data that I showed you. So I'm going to very quickly, in five minutes, introduce you to a new cohort, Our Future Health. Um, some of the language in these standard slides <laughs> is upbeat, um, because we're upbeat people. And uh, the aim here is to build a new population-based cohort in the UK. Uh, obviously, all of this builds on UKB, what UKB has shown is possible, everything that UKB has done already. Um, slight differences with UKB. We intend to develop integrated risk scores for personal disease risk of a, of a handful of diseases and offer them back to participants and see what happens. And... Um, we intend to recontact people on a uh, subgroup basis, and the subgroups might be determined by risk. If researchers such as yourselves wish to do additional studies, maybe intervention studies in people at particularly high risk. Um, we've got about 270 million uh, pounds of funding, about half from the UK government, about half from a consortium of founding members. Uh, the charities were supposed to come to the party, but the moment COVID hit, um, they all said we're broke. Um, but they do uh, contribute advice and logos uh, to our materials, and we're hopeful that they'll play a larger role in the future. So here are the founding partners in our future health, including UKRI. Uh, the modest Ambition is to recruit 5 million adults in the UK. Um, right now, we're just repeating uh, second phase pilot studies um, over here. Uh, we call it the community route. Rory Collins called it pop-up clinics. That's exactly what they are. You get an invitation, please come to this place, uh, fill out the questionnaire, we'll take two tubes of blood. Um, and we're testing these in mobile clinics and next year, we should be offering this to blood donors. We actually did a successful pilot in blood donors last year, um, and possibly in hospital uh, patients. Standard stuff, questionnaire, physical measurements, um, consent for data linkage, and maybe for the future, Aiden, uh, wearables and other apps. Um, we started a second round of pilots just in 
July, August, really in August, not a great time to start a new study in, uh, in the North and in London. Uh, we are working with Boots quite a bit as the location of where the blood is taken, invitations through NHS Digitrials, um, and we're offering appointments between now and March in these enhanced pilot studies. And um, to a lesser extent, uh, people who are outside the areas where we're currently running clinics can complete the questionnaire and when we get around to their geographic location, be invited for a 20 minute visit, blood pressure, point of care cholesterol, and uh, two tubes of blood. I said that online consent questionnaire uh, biological sample. We're re redeveloping a genome array with Illumina. All of this is integrated allegedly with the National Genomic Strategy and the Illumina chip, as you'd expect, um, will have a multi-ethnic GUS backbone and a series of um, additional enhancements that we've added. Um, we sort of beat the bushes for all of these disease consortia to make sure we had top hits from the polygenic risk score from the major consortia uh, on the chip. And as of yesterday, we can announce that Genomics PLC, uh, our colleagues Peter Donnelly and Gil McVeigh, will be the contractor that will be developing the integrated risk scores along with the polygenic risk scores for our future health. Um, data sharing, uh, trusted research environment, um, if you've got your own trusted research environment and meet our accreditation, which are pretty rigorous, um, it might be possible to transfer data into your own trusted research environment. Um, and registered researchers, just like UKB, um, you can have access to the TRE, so it's the model that UKB has really moved into and pioneered. Um, and our TRE alpha version is now in testing. I can't resist saying it's interesting that in 2022, we've got to the point where the funders say, you have to have your data sharing TRE up and running before you've actually collected any data. But that is the world we live in in 2022. Um, these are some of the people responsible. Uh, thank you. And here are some more of the people responsible. And uh, Michael Cook, he's appointed as a visitor in the department. Uh, Andy Rodden, also, he's the CEO, appointed as the as a visitor. Uh, Michael is the director of epidemiology. And some of you might recognize a former member, late of this parish, Ben Cairns, who's also part of the team. So I'd like to thank them for all the work they're doing. And again, thank the guys in my group for all the work that led to the uh, data I showed initially. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Sir. I mean, it's very important. I've got questions. And my question is In my own side, you have PRS people, B1 and B2. So everything that's happening. And then you said, in the next side, you said, genetic environmental interaction, lifestyle, and so it's multiplied. So, when you say everything's additive, you have to So, I, I guess I misspoke. I meant log additive, multiplicative on the regular scale. Um, well, on the uh, let me think. Okay, you're right. So, you just line them up and uh, calculate the risks, assuming independence of each variable. And... Uh, the uh, there's no super multiplicative or infra multiplicative interactions or second order interactions by and large. So is it just an observation? Say again. Is it just an observation that they? It, it it's very much an observation. Now people have worked like really hard yeah. at trying to squeeze um, conventional super multiplicative or infra multiplicative interactions out of the data. If you do a calculation with these low relative risks per allele, uh, we don't have enough power even with a thousand cases, hundred thousand cases. Um, so every so often someone will squeak one out, but uh, there's almost no sort of gene gene 
interaction that's been validated. Um, and almost no gene environment interactions apart from those pharmacogenetic examples that have been validated. Um, and all of this is completely contrary to expectation based on animal uh, studies where in highly inbred mice, there's gene gene interactions, epistasis all over the place. So, you know, we are so outbred that uh, the animal experiments are probably highly misleading. But to be fair, um, we lack power to find these. On the other hand, the fact that we lack power with 100,000 cases uh, suggests that they're going to be trivial, even if you manage to find and replicate a simple interaction. And that's before you get into anything like three or four way. Thank you. Thank you. I really, 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 really don't want to know. So, um, good point. Uh, so, basically, uh, in our future health, nobody will be given this information until they uh, say they want it. People are perfectly free to say no. And uh, we'll have extensive pretest consent materials uh, before somebody says yes or no. Well, they could say no off the bat, or they could say they could look at it and say, no, I don't want this. Um, you know, the, the alternative point of view is uh, usually we don't give any of this information to anybody. We're doing research. So the public engagement work we've done consistently, most people say, if there's something I, you think I should know that's treatable or preventable, you have an obligation to tell me. So that those are the two poles that we're dealing with. And the problem we're gonna have is that the tradition in conventional genetic counseling for these very high risk, you know, relative risk to 20 type of things is, you know, a couple of sessions of in-person one-to-one -one or maybe sometimes group counseling and then post-test counseling. And you can't do that at scale, you know, the GP has 10 minutes. So um, it's a matter of developing materials that Again, put this in the context for most people of just a regular biomarker, because we're not talking about these massive relative risks. Once you get into the top one or two percent, where some of the clinicians want to go, um, we have to be very careful uh, for all obvious reasons, but also for that reason that our estimate of the one percent might be very robust. I think it's a very tricky area. I think it's a very tricky area. That's very very tricky, but you could say the same thing about any biomarker. You know, you run, you know, I go to the doctor, they don't ask for my consent, they take some blood every couple of years, they run a panel of biochemical markers, and, you know, only a small handful of those things do I have any idea that they're doing. And um, sometimes a flag comes up and I get called back and, oh, you've got a high alkaline phosphatase, uh, uh, maybe we should explore why. So we've got to somehow in the face of genetic determinism, um, move this into the space if we're going to use it, uh, just regular biomarkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So repeat the question. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yes. For the, for the... Is that okay if you want to do that? No, that's fine, but that he repeats it. Can I ask if you define the population based on CRX? Do you need to test the intervention? in that population. I mean, I'm thinking of breast cancer, for instance, yep. where we know some of the interventions are likely to be better in certain types of disease. Globular cancer is not seen well by the Endocrine chemo prevention will only work preventing ER positive diseases. So is it an assumption that the PRS defined population will, will react in the same way to an intervention for any disease? Or do those populations, you have to do the trials in the PRS to find population to confirm the efficacy and, of course, the toxicity of that particular intervention? So, so I think the question in brief is, um, do we have to do intervention studies to determine whether this information is clinically useful? And what do we do about the fact that for many diseases there are subtypes and we've got better interventions for some types than others. 
But the polygenic risk score might not be subtype specific, it might be sort of global. And the quick answer is you're completely correct, um, but we're probably not going to be able to give you PRS for lobular that are as robust as PRS for total, just like we couldn't give you PRS for ER negative that's as robust as for ER positive. So all we're, move, all we're doing, I think, is potentially, um, in this case, moving women into a uh, early detection screening pathway where the risks of screening might be outweighed by the benefits because they're at higher risk versus our current attitude, which is come on, come all at this age. And in the population we're bringing, there might be some very low risk women for whom the risk of something like mammography screening might outweigh the benefit because they're at such low risk. Uh, but there's obviously risks associated with mammography and subsequent workups. So um, again, what the polygenic risk scores are giving us are risk classifiers on the sort of total and then it's the clinician's job, unfortunately, to decide what to do with that information. Okay, well, I think we've reached uh, the end for today. So okay. I'd like to thank, thank Professor Hunter. <laughs> and we'll see you all next week. Thank you.